You know, I'm gonna give you a history lesson. We got some dumbass motherfuckers floating around this country. <laughs> start laughing! <laughs> and when I do, start fucking. Also, y'all did some nasty ass jokes on my ass, too. Funny jokes and unfunny jokes come out of the same birth. You fucking guys are unbelievable. Why are you laughing? Evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Why Are You Laughing? A History of Comedy Podcast. Coming to you live, back home from the Vaulted Podcast Studios, and today I am pleased to introduce you to Roseanne Barr, a very controversial figure in comedy. Uh, like I said, we're back home in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, in the vault, with uh, just me and Matt today. Hello, sir. Hello. It's been a while. Yeah, it has been a while. And, it's good uh, to have you back. Yeah. It's good to have everybody's favorite second mic on Why You Laughing. <laughs> People have been complaining. <laughs> um, yeah, um, the rumors of my death have been greatly exaggerated. No, he's back. He's back in business, baby. He's uh, reinvigorated. Yeah. And we're, like I said, we're in the vault today. And if you want to come uh, check it out in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, record some stuff. And uh, on the way in, it's uh, about 100 degrees outside today. And there was a gentleman uh, walking shirtless with a bathing suit down the street. So it's yeah. ripe with crazy characters yeah. not, in here. Not a pool within 10 <laughs> miles of, of this location. <laughs> There's some zaniness down here in Pawtucket. So uh, make sure you check out the vault if you want your pot. It sounds so much better already. Than uh, over Streamyard. So. I don't. I don't want to pull. Thank you. I don't want to pull back the veil, you know that much. But today, you know, we we film a bunch in a row when we yeah. come here. But uh, this is three of the ones I've been very like most oh, really? excited for. Yeah. These oh, are three, good. These are going to be three great episodes. Yeah, I sure. think so too. I was excited for all of them, and uh, this one is uh, definitely one. Uh, it, uh, Roseanne is a very strange character. And one that I think has been painted in a light that is unfair at times. Uh, and there's also things I didn't know about her that are fucking insane as well. So we'll get into all of that. But first, I do want to remind you to go to blindmike.net. That's where you can get these episodes a week early, if you'd like. If you just can't wait for Why You Laughing to come out, you can uh, subscribe to the Patreon to get those a week early, as well as bonus content. Um, we're watching Quincy on the Patreon, all kinds of wacky stuff over there. So... Uh, go to blindmike.net. That's where you can find the Patreon, our merch, or if it's easier to just support the show for free, we understand. Uh, you can do that by you know subscribing, liking, five starring, all the things that you do for podcasts on you know Apple, Google, uh, Stitcher, whatever. Uh, all those links are there at blindmike.net. So check that out. Um, yeah, were you a Roseanne fan as a kid? Yeah, I was. Yeah, it was. My dad was a big fan of Roseanne, and it kind of rubbed off on me. And I kind of put it in the same category as like, I was a big fan of Married with Children, and right. it was like it. It felt like a kind of like a an offshoot of that. Very almost. similar. Yeah. yeah, the '90s is when they started to capitalize. It's interesting because the biggest shows in the '90s, like Friends and Seinfeld, were kind of like you know rich upper Manhattan. Sort of, un they worried that it was like unrelatable to the Midwest and things like that. Yeah. Whereas the other popular shows, like Roseanne, Married with Children, I mean, Cosby was a doctor, so that doesn't necessarily fit. But like, yeah. they they kind of played to um, uh, both both ends of the spectrum in the '90s. I feel like. And then you got like, then you get into like Everybody Loves Raymond, and f for what it's worth, according to Jim, I love that show. Really? Yeah. And like, oh, that, God. That, I feel like that. Like, if you're talking about coaching trees, like that is, I think it comes from there as well. Yeah. So uh, we'll get into all of that, but I want to start um, with Roseanne very early in life because obviously we'll get to her controversies as well um, that have kind of finished her career, really. Um, but I do kind of want to build a case as to why she's a more sympathetic character than I think a lot of people realize. And I feel like she was uh, judged too harshly and is kind of an example of uh, not even cancel culture, but just the phoniness of society where we pretend to have sympathy for a lot of people. But when there's a, a real life example of someone who might need legitimate help, we're like, ah, fuck her. Cause she has the wrong, you know, opinions that, right. that we've, that we've judged. So right out of the gate, the thing I didn't know um, that kind of stemmed from some of these controversies. When she went on Rogan, she talked about this. She's now the second comedian we've talked about uh, that suffered from brain damage at an early age. Very shocking that Roseanne had brain damage. But um, she talked about it a little on Rogan, so let's hear her uh, kind of explain what happened, and then we'll get into it a little more. What, what was it that when you first got um, brought into a mental hospital, what was it about? Well, I had got hit in, uh, by a car, and the uh, 
the hood ornament went in my head, in my brains, Oof. and scrambled them. And I, I used to be an A-plus math student. I was just great in geometry. Oh, my God, I loved geometry. I got straight A's. And uh, then, you know, I sort of fell apart after that. It took a long time to uh, heal from it and, um, you know. Uh, the, How much did your personality change? Oh, it changed drastically. But, you know, you read all that stuff about uh, traumatic head injuries now because I, I do read a lot and talk to a lot of football players who have the same thing, and we, we do discuss it. Yeah, you change right away. Yeah. It's still you, but it's like a – it's kind of like an artificial – intelligence you i like the idea of roseanne sitting down with uh, like fred smurless and just chatting about <laughs> cte <laughs> but but um yeah so the thing that i found uh kind of interesting there and we talked about this with kinnison a little bit where i think the and i'm uh, guilty of this as well like when you hear brain damage you think oh that it's someone that can't communicate with people you know what I mean? Like if you hear Roseanne talk, she's very coherent and with it and can be funny and sharp. Yeah. So you don't think like that's someone who suffered from brain damage. You don't necessarily realize the effects that it has on people where by all accounts, like because they said the same thing about Kinnison, where, you know, his personality just he was a different guy. It wasn't yeah. so much that he couldn't articulate his thoughts anymore. It was just that he was a different human being, you know? Yeah. And same with Roseanne. The, the, the Rose, Roseanne talking about getting hit by a car. And the hood ornament, oh. ornament going into her head is like tragic, but also coming from Roseanne sounds like a hilarious like Ed, like scrambled them, yeah. scrambled the brains. <laughs> yeah, just just the delivery. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's uh, she's a very, you know another example of one of these very funny but tragic yeah. characters. Um, and another thing, so I did, never knew this. Uh, I guess she talked about it on Arsenio Hall. I say I guess I watched the interview, but there wasn't any. It was like too long to really uh, throw in as a clip, so I'll try and give the abridged version, at least of what she talked about on Arsenio. Um, so she's an incest survivor as well, and uh, she talked about this, and the family vehemently denied it. And um, then evidently, this person, um, she didn't get into specifics. I don't know if it was an uncle or what exactly the relationship was, but when she got married to Tom Arnold... Um, one uh, someone in Tom Arnold's family accused, without knowing any of these allegations, accused the same family member of doing something inappropriate with them. Huh. Um, so, like I said, it was Arsenio, so the, the she didn't get into too graphic detail with it. Yeah. So I can't speak to exactly what happened. But Roseanne had a lot of uh, you know childhood trauma, and you know, and the idea that the family completely denied it, I imagine that didn't help. Uh, she left home when she was eighteen. She grew up in Utah. And uh, she says she grew up Jewish, but in that community, very Mormon based. And I guess her parents were, I don't know if it was ashamed or just tried to hide it to, to blend in or whatever it was. But she said basically like half the week when she was home, they were a Jewish family. And when they went out in public, they would literally like go to church. They would go to service. Oh, that's funny. As like a, you know, Mormon, Christian, whatever the fuck it is, family. Like they would just try to blend into society. Right. Um, huh. So, yeah, a lot of childhood trauma. Then she moved to Colorado when she was 18, started playing, like, the Denver Comedy Works and things like that. And um, very, very quickly uh, saw success when she moved to Los Angeles. Uh, I will say a sort of um, uh, misrepresentation of Roseanne's career was that she had, like, you know, six minutes of stand-up and got famous off of that. I don't know that that's entirely true after going through it. Like, she was on um, Rodney Dangerfield's Young Comedians. She was on uh, t The Tonight Show. Um, and then she got an HBO special, um, which was, I will say, there were parts of that that were not stand up. Um, I think it came out in 87, a year or two before the show. Mm. And there were, if you go watch it, it's essentially Roseanne, <laughs> except she's a comedian. Like, she's not a factory worker uh, or anything in that. But, like, the set is very similar, and she's a mom, and she's going through, like, some of her stand-up with her kids. And uh, I think Tom Arnold plays the husband. I think this is before they were married. Um, but it was kind of, it felt like a scene from Roseanne 
which I think is obviously where uh, then ABC went to her and said, we want to make this show around you. But anyways, uh, all of that to say that I do think it's a kind of a misconception that she had like five minutes of stand up and then just got huge. But she was, you know, very early on, very successful because I think she fit a, um, uh, you know, a demographic that they wanted to make successful. You know, she was a Midwestern housewife, very crass, not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, uh, stereotypically attractive, I guess no. you could say, you know. So she was a unique kind of character that you didn't hear a lot of. Also, uh, like uh, on American Idol, they might say she has a certain sound. Like, yes. <laughs> yeah, she was very, yeah. very unique. <laughs> yeah, yeah. St stands out, if you will. But yeah, she really did. Like she had that voice that just kind of got your attention and it was very annoying at times but it definitely stood out for sure yeah. um but let's hear a little of her stand up on her first ever tonight show appearance oh hi <laughs> i've been married for 13 years and let me tell you it's a thrill to be out of the house <laughs> I never get out of the house. I stay home all the time. I never do anything fun because I'm a housewife. I hate that word, housewife. I prefer to be called domestic goddess. <laughs> I feel it's more descriptive. And you know what I do all day. Yeah, you're right. I lay there on that couch eating those bonbons, watching those soap operas, and tuning into that Donahue show. There's a show you could really learn something from. I didn't even know it was possible to be a woman trapped in a man's body. Oh, that wouldn't fly. Netflix would get a lot of letters about that joke today. But. <laughs> I think they would. <laughs> but, um, Dom domestic. <laughs> yeah, and you know what's funny, too, is, uh, and I think this is just, you know, you were able to do this in the 70s and 80s before, and even part of the 90s. Um, but she went on the, that was her first appearance on the tonight show. Her next appearance was like three months later. And I watched that clip too. Cause I was like, Oh, it'll be interesting to see, uh, how much she grew over those few months. And the first joke was, I, I prefer domestic goddess. Oh, really? <laughs> I oh. was like, Oh, you could just get away with that. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the set was different. Hmm. Um, cause I was going to add more cause I just thought it'd be funny to listen to the exact same set, but it, well, it was different to be fair <laughs> to her. But yeah, it's funny that back in the day, like, I guess people were just goldfish and forgot they just saw this three months ago from Roseanne. <laughs> um, but, yeah, she didn't necessarily have the, you know, catalog of material that you know, Pryor and Carlin did. Uh, so it is, there is a little bit of, like, what we see now where a lot of comedians will complain, you know, straight white guys anyways, will complain that Netflix doesn't want to buy their stuff because – Literally of their race and gender, <laughs> yeah. you know, but there was a little bit about uh, of that back then where I think we'll get into some of the uh, sexism that Roseanne dealt with. But there was a little bit of like, oh, well, there's no one else like her. Let's prop her up as opposed to someone that's been comedy longer, you know. Um, but uh, what, what's so you mentioned how um, the uh, the Roseanne Barr show kind of contain elements yeah. that would eventually become. Roseanne. Her, her show. Yeah. Um, and then also, uh, we talked about Married with Children. Yeah. Um, some of the roles in Married with Children were offered to Kinnison and Roseanne. Yeah. Both I, turned it down. To mention Kinnison again, I guess. I didn't realize how uh, how much he would be prevalent in this episode. But he, um, yeah, he was, he, so I guess when Married with Children was written, it was written for Kinnison and Roseanne, which I feel like would have been a much different show yes i think i think yes i think that uh uh katie seagal yeah is a much different actress than roseanne oh for sure actually she had a great uh roast joke at the roast of roseanne um where she hey. said that you know your career is uh so amazing you know you paved the way for uh women in sitcoms that i did a year before but so <laughs> she basically said that roseanne kind of like ripped off mary with children in a way but uh, she was offered that role, and Roseanne turned it down. Uh, Kinnison, I completely... That doesn't feel like Kinnison, that he would do a sitcom where he's married, and that would be very weird for, you know, the persona we know now uh, of Sam Kinnison. Yeah, right. Roseanne, I do think, would have fit. It would have changed the dynamic of the show, where that's like one of the... I mean, not the first. I guess the Honeymooners did it long before. But where you see, 
like just looking at them, you'd be like, why would this woman be with this asshole? You sure. know, and like she cut, she's like sex hungry, and he doesn't want any, anything to do with her. That would feel different if Roseanne was the woman in that relationship. It would be a different dynamic. The, the power structure would be totally different between, right. between the husband and wife, right? Than what we know married with children as with Al Bundy and yeah. And so I don't know exactly why Roseanne turned that down. But I think she kind of saw herself. She be- very quickly became a, a diva, Roseanne, and she suffers from um, bipolar or mul- multiple multiple personality disorder. So I'm I'm sure that plays a big factor in this. But there's an element of you know uh, when uh, Tom Warner and Marcy Carcy called up Roseanne to uh, you know say we want you to be part of this show. The way they tell it is that she's like, oh sure, that'd be fun. <laughs> And like she, you know, she was all into it, and then very quickly, I guess, became a tyrant on the set. Uh, so I don't know. Maybe Roseanne was already, you know, pretty shrewd business mind and thinking like, uh, I, I don't want to be, you know, second banana on this show. I don't want to be Al Bundy's wife. I want to be Roseanne. Which for someone who's been in comedy for six, seven years, like she was at the time, that's pretty ballsy to yeah. say no thanks. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, keep looking. Yeah. Um, and uh, Kinison was eventually married with children, by the way. Played uh, one of the angels yes. in, uh, like, This Is Your Life, Al Bundy, or yes. whatever the fuck they did. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yep. Um, all right. What, so what are we already we, at uh, her getting uh, Roseanne? You just, uh, no, you just talked about her being difficult to work with at times, and we have a clip for that. Yeah, so this is uh, Tom Warner. By the way, Tom Warner produced Cosby and Roseanne. Very interesting. Mm. Makes you wonder what he's into behind closed doors. Uh, but this is Tom Warner and Marcy Carcy. Talking about uh, Roseanne being a bit of a handful. Roseanne called me. We, we, we did what we thought was a wonderful pilot. As, as pilots go, and sometimes pilots aren't perfect, but as pilots go, this was a really, it was, it was like an A-plus as, as a 22-minute piece of film to sell a series. And we were editing it, and we were just feeling so great because we thought that we were, we had something that really was, valuable and about something and Roseanne called me during the editing and said that uh, she hated the experience and she was going to quit and she wasn't going to do the series and it was like a blow to the stomach because we're just actually in the editing room watching something that we think is going to be really special and I don't know whether she meant it for that moment or was or was trying to get something for it but it there was there was too much tension on that show and it was never appropriate well, soon after that, she called. I was in Cape Cod on vacation, and uh, she had her agent call to say that um, unless we fired seven people, the director, the head writer, the whatever, I mean, just seven random people, she didn't even know them that well. We'd only done one or two episodes or something, that she was going to leave the show. <laughs> that's, such, that's such a funny it's, thing It's such, to such balls to be, <laughs> literally be in stand-up for six, seven years. And she's had success. She's been on the Tonight Show. She had an HBO special, blah, blah, blah. But to be in stand-up that short of time and be like, fuck you. This was <laughs> this pilot was dog shit. I want more power after one episode. Yeah. That is balls. And there's a funny element of what I would call, like, listen, I think we've gone way too far in labeling things sexist and misogynist and racist and all the all these labels that we put on things. It, it's too frequent. It's the, the words are thrown around way too much. You guys have heard me talk about that a million times. But I do think um, an example of sexism is sort of when, you know, we look at guys like uh, George Steinbrenner is the best example that comes to mind. We kind of remember him as like this zany character. And, oh, he was a genius. He was hilarious. You know, he would fire people at the drop of the dime. Whereas Roseanne is kind of labeled as more of a bitch. And Ellen had the same thing. Where and part of the Ellen thing is that she's you know kind of a nice she dances on stage and shit like that. Yeah. Um, but when you hear about Ellen as a boss, when she's a bit of a tyrant, you know her career ended. Like essentially, she lost her show. Yeah, her show was because good. she was known as like a, a tough pain in the ass to work with boss. Uh, and I feel like guys don't deal with that as much. You're almost looked at as like a, a tough, shrewd businessman. Yeah. Um, the other interesting thing, if you watch a little more of that interview with these two. Um, they're talking about what a pain in the ass Roseanne is to work with. And this was uh, filmed a few years ago. 
And they're like, Where, whereas Bill, on the other hand, Bill Cosby, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bill was a joy to work with. He was a never had a problem. He was a delight. <laughs> and it's like, ah, oh, that doesn't age well, he Tommy. He was always getting people drinks at the crafty table. It oh, was great. God, you needed something. He was there to hand it to you. <laughs> yeah, it is hilarious to watch old people talk about Cosby 10 years ago. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, well, an- another uh, altercation that they got into was, um, and she kind of alludes to it there. But uh, so Tom Werner and Marcy Carsey produced The Cosby Show, and they took uh, one, I think he was one of the head writers um, with Cosby. Uh, Matt Williams was his name? Yes. Um, and they they wanted him to basically like mock up the what Roseanne would be. Like they didn't call it Roseanne at the time, obviously. But uh, these two producers said, you know, they would try to think of what's not on television. Uh, so they looked at Married with Children and say, let's let's rip that off. Uh, no, but they said, what's not on television? And that's like a blue collar woman uh, who, you know, works for eight hours a day, then comes home and has to take care of the kids for another eight hours. Um, that's a that's a demographic that's not really represented on television right now. And so they had Matt Williams write a script. And develop these characters, and then they saw Roseanne and said, "Oh, she's perfect for it." And she's, a, you know, got this weird voice, and she's not typically what you would cast in Hollywood. Uh, they said, "Let's get her," and they called her up, and like I said, she was all on. Oh, sure. And they were worried about her acting, and it's funny. Tom Warner really takes a dig at her, and he goes, uh, "She wasn't." A very good actor, and I don't know that she ever really became a good actor. <laughs> um, but they, their logic was, let's get great actors around her, and that's why you have John Goodman and all these other people that are involved with Roseanne. Amazing, by the way, that they had John Goodman because I, I don't know that you'd consider him necessarily an A-list actor, but he's a huge actor that was on a sitcom for was it nine years. Yeah, like a big movie star. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, anyways, they you know they built this show. And uh, Roseanne was kind of just brought in as, you know, the main character and would have a part in the writing and everything. But, you know, they brought her in to fill this role. And then uh, the pilot aired, like they said, 21 million viewers, which another interesting note, by the way, 21 million viewers for the pilot of this. Uh, when they rebooted Roseanne, everyone was all excited. So, like, you know, eyes were actually on it because it was a show they had heard of. 18 million viewers, <laughs> which is how much times have changed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, so Matt Williams writes this script and everything, and Roseanne says she's like, "Well, they got you know we kind of used this domestic goddess thing, even though in their minds it was already kind of the structure of what they wanted." But she's like, "You know, they they took my home life and they put this Matt Williams asshole as the creator," and I guess she lost her fucking mind. She's very upset. and said, uh, "If you don't get rid of Matt Williams." I, I'm done. <laughs> and so they they had to. I think Matt Williams stayed on for like the first 13 episodes, and then they just had to get rid of him. <laughs> and yeah. He's like, what the fuck? And uh, she would like they talked about in that interview there. She would do things like, you know, put the name of seven people up on her office door, and say, just so you guys know, these these are the seven people we're gonna fire when we hit number one. <laughs> and then sure enough, they were number one after the first episode, and she was like, all right, beat it. <laughs> it's wild. She really was. She really was genuinely a nut. And um, they, you know, there's also the uh, Tom Arnold element of it. Yes. Which uh, her and Tom Arnold got married around this time, and uh, timeline's a little murky. By the way, Roseanne I think got divorced in like '87, and they got married in '88. So who knows what will happen mm-hmm. there? But um, Tom Arnold is a guy that, at least the way history <laughs> looks at him, is he was essentially like Roseanne's trophy wife <laughs> that she would just like get jobs. Like the reason he had a career in Hollywood, uh, a lot of people would say, is because of Roseanne. So Tom Arnold became a producer on Roseanne and also had these other projects in the works um, in large part to her relationship with Roseanne. He had a role on the show, um, and it was a very volatile relationship and a very volatile uh, time period. There was a lot of uh, coke and drugs involved, and uh, is that the clip we have next? Is those two splitting uh, up? So we have that one. We also have the one of uh, Tom Arnold on Watch What Happens Live talking about Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Uh, yeah, let's hear that first. So we get a little uh, glimpse into some of the hijinks they would get into on set. So I guess they uh, recorded the same lot as Seinfeld, and uh, had some sort of a rivalry with that crew. 
And so uh, Julia Louis-Dreyfus came into park one day, and this is what happened. If you're listening to this just audio, it's worth looking up either this clip or watching us on YouTube right now, because Andy Cohen's face after... <laughs> so That's some clever wordplay. <laughs> Andy Cohen was so offended by that. His face is just like... <laughs> well, so also, funny. you know, Andy Cohen's like, I want her on my show. Let's not get crazy. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's not do that. My favorite uh, kind of glossed over part of that story is... Like, did they go to John Goodman and say, hey, we need a picture of your ass, buddy? <laughs> I, I <laughs> Bend over. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I would imagine I, John Goodman seems like a pretty easygoing guy. Yeah. I would think that maybe Roseanne was like, I need a picture of your ass and had a pull. Because like, all right. Then, Polaroid, yeah, Polaroid <laughs> picks the right He's like, all right. This is good lighting. Yeah. So they would, they would do shit like that. They were, you know, considered difficult to work with. They were uh, maniacs. They were kind of, you know, coming out of that coke-fueled. 80s and uh hadn't developed past that yet really yeah. and so uh tom and roseanne were very volatile uh, and you know they were parodied on snl and all over the place jo tom arnold and roseanne jokes were being made by the way i don't know a lot about tom arnold um a couple of things i've noticed is he, he's, he gets a, a little tongue-tied with his words there yeah he said about four words in that entire yeah. thing yeah and the yeah. rest of them were just like that, 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 yeah. that, that. i remember watching him on best damn sports show when i was a kid and then now i know him as the guy that keeps saying he has an n-word tape of donald trump and never releases it <laughs> but, <laughs> but the other thing i noticed is he's very quick to throw roseanne under the bus yeah. Like it seemed like Tom Arnold had a lot to do with the shenanigans that went on in the early Roseanne days. But if you listen to him now, he's like, oh, I tried. I tried to stop her, guys. Yeah, he couldn't stop her. <laughs> yeah. She was just a maniac. But yeah, like I said, a volatile relationship. And Tom Arnold went on uh, Jay Leno, The Tonight Show, mm. uh, to kind of explain uh, what was happening in their marriage at the time. Now, didn't you guys have, uh, again, all, uh, yeah. you know, I hear this stuff in the paper, and I, right. I would be remiss right. if I did not ask you about it. Now, I heard there was like a big blow up on the set on right. Friday. You guys were just like a big yelling, well, screaming. Yeah, there was. There, started we, we, there. That's we where have it started. Had, we have had blow ups on the set before. You know, I'm executive producer, and she's what? a star. I'm shocked. And uh, I know. And sometimes we disagree over, you know, uh, creative uh, things. Uh, yeah, we have differences. And it usually it works out, it works out okay. Uh, Friday was not a blow up on the set. Friday was... Uh, uh, Friday was interesting. I, I was driven into work, uh, and the guy that drives me, as we pulled in the gate to the studio, he turns to me and says, uh, I said, take me to my office, and he said, it's no longer your office. <laughs> and uh, I said, really? What, whose office is it? He says, it's Rosie's office. Yeah, I, I, there's just something that does make me feel a little bit, A, I could see Roseanne doing that 100%, but also Tom Arnold kind of paints himself as this innocent, like, just showing up for work. Yeah. <laughs> Right. What? Yeah. <laughs> I've been fired. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's a why. And Tom Arnold, again, like this kind of arrogant guy, he goes on The Tonight Show with Leno. And this is like right after all the Carson stuff with Letterman and everything that we've talked about on a prior episode. Go back and listen. Um, but Tom Arnold goes, like, Jay asks him a question. And Tom Arnold goes, well, that's interesting, Dave. Like, trying to make that joke. And Jay, <laughs> and Jay just goes, yeah, I don't think you can afford to lose friends right now, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> like, everyone knew this guy was on the brink of extinction in Hollywood if Roseanne wasn't there to, you know, lobby for him and, and save him. But, yeah, evidently he went up to their the office. There was, uh, you know, a big blow up. Roseanne had him uh, hauled off. There's also some, like, domestic violence stuff where uh, Roseanne accused him of, like, screaming at her and threatening to kill the kids and shit like that, uh, which... You know, you can take one of two ways. Maybe he was a violent guy. Also, maybe he's just all coked up and saying angry shit. Who knows? Yeah. But there was a lot of, uh, you know, like I said, it, maybe it goes both ways. But it seemed like a very dangerous relationship that was probably best for both of them that uh, it ended. So that was around like 93, 94, somewhere in that area. So Roseanne's really cooking at that time. But uh, if we could go back a few years, I think the next thing is the National Anthem, right? Yes, correct. Yeah, so if we could go back a few years, um, when Roseanne really started to pop, uh, Tom Werner owned the Padres at the time, and um, they thought it would be a good idea, a little exposure. I don't think this game was televised, um, but this performance of the National Anthem certainly was, which uh, I'd say that's probably Roseanne's like maybe second or third most famous thing. Like if you think of Roseanne... Obviously, you think of the show, 
but then a lot of people think of the national anthem. Yeah. <laughs> where it's truly one of the worst performances of all time. So let's it's hear awful. it first. was on purpose. <laughs> at, the, at the end, she's laying it on. You can tell. <laughs> Her, my favorite part of thing about that is yeah. the bow. She it's it's the most aggressive bow in history. Yeah. She's like trying to headbutt the ground. And well, and then after that, she grabs her crotch and spits yeah, like yeah. a like a real lady. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good. Now I here, loved, I love that they were. She was loving it every second of it. She yeah. was loving it. She had to plug her ears from the booze, and she was just <laughs> trying to hear herself, and she's just belting it. Well, here's the thing, though. If you've ever heard my defense of Roseanne is this: if you ever heard her speaking voice, your first thought is not, "I bet she has a lovely." Singing, we I bet need she could to book her for the national anthem. <laughs> oh, I bet she can hum a tune. That one, <laughs> she's a real treat to listen to. <laughs> like I said, American Idol would say she has a certain sound. Yes, yeah, it's uh, a, a the audible experience with Roseanne is not a pleasant one. No, I mean, the visual is not terrific either, but uh, <laughs> she's not uh, classically. Uh, a beautiful voice, I wouldn't mm -hmm. say. So, the idea that she would be like good. <laughs> Is bizarre. What did you think Roseanne would be? Yeah. You know, so there's, uh, I don't want to say conspiracy theories around this, but a lot of people have framed it as like Roseanne, you know, this was her takedown of America and she was trying to send a message about, you know, modern society or government or, you know, there's all these like conspiracy theories. What, what I think it is, is she wasn't a very good singer. <laughs> And realized halfway through, well, this sucks. I might as well just lean into it. Yeah. Um, so this is her with uh, our boy Ronnie Bennington, I believe, uh, talking about that experience. But yeah, you, I could sing good. You... No, I could sing yeah. well. And I had practiced uh, for a long time to sing it. The night before I sang it, I went on Johnny Carson again. And Johnny says, now you be careful not to start too high because... And then he named Robert Goulet, who had started too high and screwed it up, and everyone hated him and all Sure. That. <laughs> so, of course, I started too high. Mm -hmm. And, uh, like, about six notes into it, I was like, can I stop and start again? But I knew I couldn't. So I, I knew there's no way I'm going to make those high notes. So I just thought, what the hell? I'm a comic, and I'm going to make it funny because I have, like, way overshot my wad here <laughs> <laughs> on the starting too high thing. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, going from being a beloved person to a despised and hated person over literally overnight. And by the time I got home from the uh, baseball thing, uh, I was on a private jet owned by the Padres, and uh, as I boarded the jet, they said, don't worry about a thing. We've got your back. And by the time I landed, they said, we have no idea how she got on the field. <laughs> <laughs> Just throwing her under the bus. <laughs> but it's interesting because now, now I think it would just be mocked. Like, that would be played all the time. It would be a TikTok phenomenon, and um, it would just kind of become part of the – the culture that we just make fun of this video uh, back then. And the peak of this obviously was around like nine 11, but back then that was looked at as like a real disrespect to the country. Like you were shitting on the American flag by screwing up the anthem the way you were, you know what I mean? Like your intentions must've been impure if you were going to do that badly. So people were really uh, outraged by that. Um, but nonetheless, despite her uh, being a sort of a villain in that scenario, Roseanne was a monster. Like, I don't know if you watched Roseanne while it was on. I was probably only six or seven when it went off the air. So my awareness of it was like it was on TBS every day after school. Uh, so like when you came home, just Roseanne was the, the thing that was on. And um, what they did is really, you know, I think, like I said, I'm, I wasn't the biggest fan necessarily, but I saw enough to at least get what they were going for. The vibe of it. Yeah. And I thought what they did a brilliant job of creating. 
And you saw this in Lucky Louie, where we talked about uh, Lucky Louie a few weeks ago. And they had the, you know, the dingy set that people said was like too drab. And what Louie was going for there was like kind of just a rundown, you know, it's a married couple that's kind of scraping by. And that was, you know, taken from Roseanne. I mm-hmm. think Roseanne was the, Roseanne, I think, is the best example of a set where you're like, oh, this is a family that's like, you know, they own their house and everything, but they're not doing well. You know what I mean? Like, they did a perfect job of encapsulating, like, lower middle class or yeah. whatever, whatever you want to call it. Because mm-hmm. even, like, I think the blanket that was on my chi- on, on their couch reminded me of, like, my great-grandmother's house, the quilt she had or something like that. Yeah. Like, it was very – they did a perfect job of making it a drab. Roseanne's the perfect casting for that. Um, the kids, like, their the plaid clothing that they wore and shit like that, the way they talked mm-hmm. was very – you know, kind of Midwest, lower class, again, whatever you want to call it. I thought they did a great job of portraying that lifestyle, and Roseanne was the perfect person to do that. And it resonated with America, obviously. It lasted nine seasons. Um, and by the end, Roseanne made, I think, like $20 million a season. Yeah, She was the second highest paid woman on television after Oprah at the time, which is pretty crazy. <laughs> that's, that's good company to be in. Yeah. So- they were making a shit ton of money. Um, the last season is uh, controversial in the sense that, so uh, the last season is basically like the Connors win the lottery. And that's when so- a lot of people said like, oh, jump the shark. It's good because now they're like, a, they redid the set. Yeah. They were supposed to be like mm-hmm. this hoity-toity kind of, they were trying to adapt to like, Rich lifestyle, which, I, by the way, I also like the idea that you win the lottery and just, like, redo your house rather than move. <laughs> that was, like, fun. Like, they stayed yeah. in the same house, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is a hilarious concept. But people were like, ah, eh, this isn't the same show. Then they did a very interesting thing in the finale where it it's like, oh, that was all a dream. And then yeah. the reality of that was that, like, John Goodman died when he had a heart attack. And the mother... Uh, was actually like a closeted lesbian or the the aunt. I, I forget. Yeah, exa- the aunt, yeah. I forget exactly what it was. But basically, everyone had almost the opposite storyline of what you were watching in that last season, yeah. which is a very interesting way to do it. Like it's one of those finales that is heavily talked about. I don't know if people loved it at the time, but like the Sopranos, like the more you think about it over the years, you're like, oh, that's kind of an int- that's a very interesting way to do it. As yeah. opposed to just like, you know, an episode where some of the old characters come. Hey, it's Tom Arnold. Who would have thought he'd be on the last episode? It, it you ju- know, it just felt like it's. It would be like the equivalent of like the last season of Sopranos being a like a version of the show where like Bugs Bunny was in it with Tony. Like you know, like, <laughs> yeah. It, it just or it's almost like the the Kevin Finnerty thing they did in the Sopranos, where totally. you're like, why is it, he's a different guy now? I don't get it. Yeah, I mean, that, I, I I did like those episodes, but I know I get what you mean. It's yeah. like it doesn't fit the it didn't fit what the show was the, the entire time it was on TV. Right. So then that's where I almost wonder is the ending like kind of a cop out where you're acknowledging, oh, people didn't like this last season, so let's just say none of it happened. <laughs> Yeah. Let's just pretend it was a dream. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, that's was my it a thought. was it a brilliant twist or was it like an apology to the audience for wasting your time with the last season? Yeah, I think it's you more know? the latter. Yeah, and that's yeah. Pr- and that's probably true, but I do think Roseanne is like smarter than she gets credit for. Like, you don't hear her mentioned with these other people with Cosby or Seinfeld or these people that had a lot of control over their show. But, like, Roseanne built a, a phenom of a, a, a sitcom. Yeah. Like, one of the biggest sitcoms in the history of television was built by Roseanne. She deliberately took power. Like, you heard, you know, the producers talk about the fact that she, you know, t- took over the show and really wanted to have full control. Mm-hmm. And yet you don't hear her credited with being, um, you know, this this kind of iconic person in television, really. No. Um but yeah, she was making uh, like twenty million dollars a season, crazy money. And then I guess Tom Warner and Marcy Carsey and Roseanne went and pitched to I think ABC and CBS a spinoff with Roseanne, which she probably should be glad that that didn't happen. Yeah, because it's like, what did they get divorced and she just doesn't see her kids anymore? Like, what what would be the? How would you explain and her would you not separate? being around this family? Yeah, well, I mean, you 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 
technically, I mean, you with the end of the season, you kill off John Goodman. Oh, true. That's a good point. I forgot but, about that. Yeah. But, but again, yeah, it's like how is that? How is the Roseanne show not going to be the Roseanne? Like, like even the show that just came back a few years ago, The Connors. Like, yeah. it's about the family. How do you right. not have it be about the family? As yeah, well? you're almost always lucky if a spinoff gets rejected. It's probably like uh, when The Office. The Office literally did an episode in their last season where it's like, this is what Dwight's spinoff would be. Hmm? Does America want to see Dwight? Yes. No. And everyone was like, nah, we're good. We've seen him. <laughs> no, no. Under the fluorescent lights, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But so that was kind of the end of Roseanne's career for a while. Well, like, in 2009, she had quite the uh, quite the, uh, well, the star-studded a, year. She had, a, she had a bit of a reboot a few <laughs> years ago. But uh, for a while, yeah. she... You know, she had some like cooking show. Like they kind of tried to turn her into like white trash Martha Stewart a little bit. That, I do remember that, that. Didn't, that didn't really work. Which that's not a crazy idea. I, like that makes sense to try that with her, uh, but it didn't really work. And also, if you look now in today's television and, and everything, there's so many cooking shows. Right. So really, it would have worked if it hit the right. It, it, something like that would have worked. Well, and it would have hit somebody. You I also have to ask yourself: It would would it have worked with Roseanne? Like, is she actually passionate about cooking or homemaking, or is she now just a, a you know millionaire businesswoman? Right. Like, so does she even relate to that lifestyle? On paper, I guess it works. But yeah, you're right. It right. would have to be on Roseanne. Um, and then she made her return to stand up. She had an HBO special in 2005. Um, I watched a little bit of it. It's like, you know, if you liked. What we played on the Tonight Show, you might like it, mm. but you wouldn't be like, "Oh, geez, how did she not stick with stand up more?" <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, she like took a long time off of stand up, obviously, and that's where you get the like she only had six minutes. She had more material than that, but that is like what she got famous off of is the Tonight Show and Rodney Dangerfield's Young Comedians. Um, so like when she came back in two thousand five, I think she says it was after like Rogan and Doug Stanhope convinced her. To uh, get on stage. Yeah. And like Stanhope talks about how he loves Roseanne. It's always interesting when, like, because I don't look at Roseanne. Like, she's obviously a talented comedian for sure, whether you like her material or not. Uh, definitely talented. Um, but I'm not a huge fan of hers. So it's interesting when you hear a guy like Doug Stanhope, who I think is a genius. Be like, I love Roseanne. She's hilarious. She's an influence of mine. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes the comics, comics don't really do it for me in, in that respect. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, you I mean like know. who they talk about? Yes, or who they prop up? Yeah, like yeah. I don't understand. Like I, Joe Rogan is like they they people parry him all the time, being like this person kills. Yes, yeah, yeah like murders and like how how much can you how many more times can you say murder or kill right. about a comedian? But like it was the same thing with like Roseanne. It's like I I, I get it, but I don't I don't get it. Yeah, <laughs> well here here's where I do get it. Where like it's not for me, but it was never supposed to be. I was not when they when they said, "Hey, let's make Roseanne this, you know, factory working housewife." I was not the demographic they were going for. Sure, you know, it ended up where it hit with a lot of people. It wasn't just like women that liked that show, certainly. Yeah. Um, but like I, I wasn't who was trying to be grabbed by Roseanne. But what I said when we talked about Joan Rivers uh, a couple weeks ago, um, there are basically like three uh, is archetypes. The right word three three or four yes. different like you know. Se segments of female and female comedians. It's Joan Rivers slash Sarah Silverman. That's kind of the same one. Yeah. And like Roseanne slash Phyllis Diller is another one. And so maybe there's only two because I've combined them now. I've, yeah. I've given them even less of a. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is true, and that's Hollywood. I don't blame women for that. I think that's Hollywood's fault. Sure. Where they've really only allowed that type of woman to be successful. Like we talked about with Haiti, uh, Katie Hannigan. When Eliza Schlesinger got a lot of shit for saying, like, I'm the only woman that does, you know, World War II jokes and stuff like that. Her, the problem with what she said was she used herself as the example. Yeah. Where you don't look at Eliza Schlesinger and think, what a cerebral comedian. She's like Colin <laughs> Quinn. Yeah. Um, but she, her, she had a great point in that there is no, you know, Seinfeld of women. There's no woman that does, like... Have you ever noticed, like, when you're in an Uber and you know what I mean? Like, there's not an observational comedian, really. There's n there's aren't a lot of women that don't either talk about being a wife and mother or being a slut. You know what I mean? And that's Hollywood's fault, where you can't just have a woman that talks about conspiracy theories, oddly enough, with Roseanne or politics or yeah. anything like that. You know, that doesn't really exist. It does to some extent, like Kathleen Madigan 
and uh, Wendy Liebman, I think people like that, Bonnie McFarlane. But, you know, look at their careers. They were successful, but they weren't lifted up to be these, you know, huge voices in comedy or anything. Yeah. Um, so, anyways, I don't know why I got off on that tangent. Uh, but, oh, that's what I was saying. So, Roseanne certainly is like, you know, she hit with a lot of people and was, there's something to what she did, certainly. But she kind of went away for a long time. You didn't hear a lot from her. Uh, and then in 2009, she started popping up, as you said. Uh, <laughs> you started hearing shit from, like, I, you know, she's into conspiracy theories. She started getting a lot more into politics, which, um, you know, when Roseanne came back, or, the, yeah, it was Roseanne originally. When Roseanne came back, it was very politically, you know, they had Trump-related episodes and episodes where the neighbors were Muslim and so, you know, Roseanne didn't trust them. It's funny, I, as I explain this, I'm like, I guess I get why they kicked her off television. But but uh, I don't know that it had that angle necessarily in its original run. Or at least I think it happened more organically. Yeah. You know what more, I mean? More it, organically. It wasn't like, hey, let's insert, she has a, you know, a hot take on Clinton. You know what I mean? Like, it didn't feel like that forced into the episodes. Yeah. Um, but uh, she got more politically driven, and then there was a real controversy in 2009. Do we have a clip about that? Uh, well, we have. Or the, do yeah, we just the tweet? Do we just mention it? Oh, well, we, we just no. Yeah, we just mentioned the 2009 uh, the magazine. <laughs> yes, yeah. where uh, this is just what it was called, folks. I'm sorry, it was Hebe Magazine, <laughs> which is a satirical like Jewish magazine. Roseanne, who is Jewish, by the way, I mentioned. Posed as one Adolf Hitler on the on the cover. Quite a choice. And not not only was she Hitler, but she was putting gingerbread Jews into the oven. And so, you know, listen, I understand as I'm explaining it, it sounds pretty terrible. I don't know what the joke was, really. Like, I don't know that it's something where I would have gone, that's a poot. But clearly, with Roseanne being Jewish and being raised Jewish and everything, there is an element of like, okay, was she being purposely offensive was she making a statement or is she anti-semitic because that seems like the least likely of the three to me it sounds like someone at mad magazine got a job at hebe magazine and <laughs> got a hood emblem driven through their skull right. <laughs> it was like oh this will be funny mad magazine style yeah right that's the other thing too is this is not 1948 this is yeah. you know this is 2009 yeah. where we had a little more perspective on things right yeah, um right. Uh, now, and again, to be fair, like we said back in the day, to use that example, um, the Three Stooges dressed up as Nazis and things like that to make jokes about it and, yeah. and you know, to kind of make humor out of tragedy and all of that. So is that Roseanne, what, what Roseanne was going for? I think so. Did it fail? Maybe you could say that. But in 2009, that wasn't really a huge story, by the way. Um, it wasn't until years later where they wanted to get rid of her. Uh, but in between that time, she also like wanted to run for president. And that's still at a time. Also, Trump also wanted to run for president in 2012. So it was still at a time where when that would happen, we would laugh mm -hmm. and go, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Whereas now, I think Roseanne would have been a serious candidate, which is pretty wild. Um, but yeah, she, she got very into politics and conspiracies and everything. So does that take us to our next clip or am it I does. missing something? No, it does. All right. Yeah. So let's, let's hear this. Seriously about they, that. They, but they didn't care that you, you <laughs> sincerely apologized and did not, didn't mean to offend. You were cracking a joke about a woman. It, it was funny how they've mischaracterized it and lied about it. And pause one second. I'm sorry. To it. So this obviously is the Valerie Jarrett tweet. Um, do we have the exact tweet? I should ask you that. Uh, no, but I can get it. Yes, yeah, you can grab that. It's uh, Roseanne making a comparison uh, between Valerie Jarrett and Planet of the Apes. I forget, Matt will have it in a second, but it's, you know, this person meets this, and the, like if these two things got pregnant, it would be Valerie Jarrett, was essentially the joke. Um, now, people immediately. Uh, it was uh, Muslim Brotherhood and Planet of the Apes had a yes. baby equal VJ. Right, there you go. I was closer than I thought. I forgot it was literally if these two people yeah, had a baby. Yes, <laughs> I was just trying to come up with the hackiest thing I could. No, no, you nailed it. Yeah, so what what that is to me, um, as someone who wouldn't get outraged at stuff, it, like if I'm scrolling through Twitter and saw that, I'd go, oof, that's a fucking dumb joke to make. 
Uh, but people got very upset about it, and people yeah. said this was racist and blah, blah, blah. Now, there is some argument, and here's uh, part of my defense of Roseanne, is that uh, one of Roseanne's claims is that she did, she thought Valerie Jarrett was white, which she, she emphatically claims it, which we'll hear in a minute. Yes. But, <laughs> but she thought Valerie Jarrett was white. And if you say that there's no way she thought that, then you were saying something about facial features of certain races. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, there's an interesting racism in saying that Roseanne is racist. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's a, you're stereotyping, you're saying that this person does look like that. And Roseanne goes on here, you'll, you'll hear her explain in a minute. She's also saying it wasn't about Val Valerie Jarrett's looks, which I don't think is true. I don't think that's correct. Yeah. If you're saying these two things at a baby, you, you're- Yeah, you're talking about looks. Inherently yeah. commenting on their looks, right. I think. Right. Um, but again, if you say she's lying, if you say clearly Roseanne is lying, then what you are saying is because Valerie Jarrett looks like that. Yeah. That's the argument you're making, right? right? So there's a weird, like I said, there's a weird racism in pointing out the racism of things. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like you are trying to be pure and you're trying to be woke or whatever it is, but what you're doing is kind of acknowledging your own prejudices or your own stereotyping of people yeah uh so uh roseanne got fired pretty immediately you know she tried to put out a statement and, and fan the flames a little bit but pretty immediately um abc kicked her off this show and this is what roseanne said about it this is you want the the, re the rest of the clip yeah. oh, okay okay yeah but um yeah i like talking about the tweet but uh, yeah i seriously apologize to all whom i inadvertently offended and because they were offended for like it it wasn't even what they say they were offended because it didn't say that no but they think that i tweeted a, said she looked like uh you know somebody and i never said anything about her looks it was a political tweet and it's just proof of how um everybody's under mass mind control <laughs> well, that's, a, I, that's such a funny way to end the clip I want. <laughs> that's an interesting reach <laughs> I mean, I, here's the funny thing about conspiracy theorists. I say this about Alex Jones all the time. There's like, th their issue is they go just too far in their explanation of things. Like, don't say, Roseanne, to get your point across, don't say everyone's under mass mind control. Because then I'll get what you're saying. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, if you're saying the media lies about things and spins things, but if you say everyone's under mass mind control, then it's a little far for me to get on board with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, but, like I said, here's the thing about what Roseanne said there and you know, she kind of skirts around who, everyone who I inadvertently offended. And like, uh, I was actually just listening, uh, coincidentally listening to a clip of Anthony Cumia talk about when he got fired. And the problem a lot of these people make is then Anthony Cumia f harps on so much that the media lied. Like some people wrote that he said the N word in his tweets, which he never did. Like, so people twist it and everything. Roseanne there, you hear get hung up on the way some people portrayed it. Yeah. And some people lied about what she said exactly. But some people didn't. You know, some people looked at that tweet and said, that's offensive or that's wrong to say. You know what I mean? So you all, you get to a place where you're no longer defending what you said. Now you're blaming the people that spun it. And it's like, okay, that's fine. You should blame those people. But let me know your thoughts on what you actually said. Right. You know, don't talk about the thing that people made up. What you actually said could be deemed as offensive by a lot of people. Um, so... Like I said with Valerie Jarrett, uh, a lot of people, listen, I, I'm not the one to ask about this. I don't see very well, as many of you know. Uh, so I'm not the one to ask about this. But I have heard a lot of people say, I didn't realize she was a, a person of color. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I'd, I'd fall into that category. Yeah, so people didn't even necessarily know that. So, you know, Roseanne was basically saying she has a look to her. And it nece didn't necessarily have anything to do with the race. Obviously, as Joe Rogan later learned, Probably not a great idea to compa compare any black person to something to do with Planet of the Apes. It's just, <laughs> yes. in ha no matter what your intention is, people are going to be like, well, that's pretty fucking racist. Just don't. Yeah. That's easy. Yeah, because it's good because it's so linked to racism now. Yeah. That type of joke is so linked to a racist thought now that you just, even if you you mean something different, you know how people are going to take it. Um, but Roseanne said, I, I didn't know she was a person of color. This moment is where I absolutely believe her. <laughs> because as, as we mentioned, Tom Werner said, not the greatest actress in the world. <laughs> so it would be difficult to pull this off. Uh, this clip, 
was released. I think your kids might have released it as almost like a defense of Roseanne. That's my conspiracy theory. Yeah. Uh, because she looks horrible in this clip. Yeah, I think. terrible. But there is, and uh, like I believe her, because I, no one off camera or not not off camera, but no one that doesn't realize they're being filmed does this as a defense if you don't truly believe what you're saying. If I got thrown off my own show, yeah. like the reboot of my show, and I know that like in my heart of hearts that that wasn't my intention with the tweet, yeah. right? This might be how you this reacted. This might be how I react. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be livid. And, yeah. like, and it's crazy. So let's hear the greatest defense of Roseanne that has ever been built. I'm trying to talk about Iran. I'm trying to talk about Valerie Jarrett wrote the Iran deal. I know, but you've told me this 300 <sighs> times. Do you know that a... That's know, what my tweet was about. I know. You've explained this literally 300 times. I thought the bitch was white! God damn it! I thought the bitch was white! <laughs> Fuck! <laughs> when ABC called and asked me to explain my egregious and unforgivable tweet, I told them I thought Valerie Jarrett was white. <laughs> the, the other one is more believable. Yeah, the, the, the off-camera, quote-unquote, right. is more believable well, than this. That's why I wanted you to clip it that way, because I just love any <laughs> any meltdown where off-camera is, okay, you know, the Bill O'Reilly thing. Fuck! Let's do it live! Yeah. And then, uh, hey, here's uh, you know Pearl Jam, <laughs> whatever it is. So... I love that clip, but yeah, like you said, it is very. She's having a meltdown. Yeah, and you hear her kids there, like laughing at her. Yeah, because they're like, Jesus Christ, we've heard this ten million times. The the um the funny thing about it is, she's like, I thought the bitch was white. Yeah, and then fuck, and then she just fuck. and then off off camera, she pulls up a cigarette, takes a drag of the cigarette, yeah. and then just puts it back. Down. Hello, America. <laughs> I'm even keeled, Roseanne. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, so, so yeah, that's wild, and it uh, that's an interesting little insight. Like, I think if Roseanne's kids asked her, hey, do you want us to release this? She'd say, what are you, fucking nuts? Of course not. But I think, in my mind, they did her a favor. It didn't turn out that way, really. But it shows you the, th the thing that people are being canceled, like, go through. You know, like, when people yeah. say cancel culture isn't real, and they'll point to, like, look at Chappelle. He's still doing shows. And uh, as we record this, Chappelle just had a gig canceled in um, Minnesota. And then it was, you know, rebooked at another theater or something. So people will point to that and say, ah, see, it's not a big deal. Right. What the big deal is, is it, it's changing your life. It's inconvenient. Wh whether the inconvenience is minor or major or completely life altering, it is something in your life that you have to deal with. And what you hear Roseanne dealing with there is people calling her a racist and mischaracterizing what she really believed to be true. Um, now, are her politics crazy? Sure, probably. You know, I don't know a lot about Roseanne's politics, but I'm quite certain, based on that clip and other things that I've heard, that she's nuts. Because yeah. she's nuts. Yeah. Um, there's also an element with Roseanne where, uh, and she talked to Rogan about this, she was on Ambien. And again, when she gives that excuse, people are like, oh, bullshit. But then when you, you know, learn what Ambien does to people, it's supposed to be like a sleeping medication. But if you don't take the right dosage or whatever, however it affects you, you can be up tweeting all night. You can get in your car and drive. You know what I mean? Like you can do things that you do not mean to do. It's a very dangerous drug. Now, do you have sympathy for someone who's on drugs and tweeting? That's up to you, you know? Sure. But it does play a part in her story. And it's something that people completely ignored. So it's interesting because Roseanne is a person, in my mind, that had a, you know, what seems like a, a rough upbringing obviously between like the incest and the brain damage. And those are just the things we know about. She had a pretty, pretty rough upbringing. She's from, you know, middle America. Didn't seem to come from a lot of money or anything. You know, she's not a, a person of privilege necessarily that you would characterize her as. Like she is diversity in a way you know she's not necessarily diversity that people are looking for now because she's white but she does represent a group that is not that doesn't have the same voice that you know the hollywood elite do yeah so to me roseanne is a sympathetic character in some ways but she's not looked at that by the people that claim to be sympathetic and progressive and open-minded
Well, isn't that always the story? Like we see things of like this happening all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's it is sad in a way to see someone with brain damage who was on Ambien, who's a little fucking nutty, and who's had their career taken away from them and can understandably act a little crazy after that as well. No one has sympathy for that person. And that's how actually how Norm got in trouble. Because uh, what Norm McDonald said, this is our uh, weekly mention of Norm that we squeeze into every episode. Well, it's, it's, it's Norm, Sam Kinison, and usually Howard Stern. Yeah, we fit, we fit into every episode. Opie and Anthony get in there a lot as well. Yeah. Uh, so now we've done all four, which is good. <laughs> um, but Norm uh, reached out to Roseanne, who he was friends with, and said, uh, you know, well, this is actually interesting because remember in the Louie episode, we pointed out that Louis, uh, Roseanne was kind of the first person to out Louie and say he should be canceled. Yeah. And then Norm reached out to Roseanne and said, you know who you should talk to is Louis C.K. Um, because you two have gone through something that no one else has gone through, which is just that's inherently true. No, very few people on the planet have gone have had been making millions of dollars and had that taken away in the span of a few hours. Yeah. You know, that's not a relatable thing to you or I. Or the guy walking shirtless in his bathing suit down the street in Pawtucket. You know, we couldn't relate to that. So Norm says, hey, reach out to Louie. He might be able to give you some perspective on it. He's handled it well. Or vice versa. I forget who who was first. Um, and Norm said that on a couple of platforms and had to apologize for it. Because, because people were like, well, fuck you, buddy. Mm. How dare you mm. say Roseanne should look for someone to talk to? Again, this therapy age where we all say you should talk about your problems, you should be more open about things. How dare Norm say, hey, you should talk to someone about this, someone who relates yeah, to right. it, you know? Uh, so Roseanne, to me, is a, a, an example of, um, you know, an interesting lack of sympathy that people have and lack of perspective that people put on things. Uh, now, the big argument at this time was, um, it, you know, she was crazy. She would tweet crazy things. She's a conspiracy theorist. She's a Trump supporter, which a lot of people say is crazy. So um, she should have been fired for that. And my point is, well, she wasn't. You could say she should have been fired for that. But ABC said, hey, we know all that. We worked with her once. We thought she was a diva. And we would like to work with her again, please, because she made us money. Mm -hmm. So ABC knew all that and said, we're on board because uh, the Ro Roseanne machine is a moneymaker. And then somewhere in there, you know, corporate America started saying, we want people to view us a certain way as well as make money. Yeah. And Roseanne was kind of the, the, the beginning of that a little bit. And, um, you know, it's interesting to reap the benefits of Roseanne forever. And if the cast and the network believe that Roseanne was so offensive, I would say take the show that she created off the air. Take the characters that she built – you know the the set that she that she created and made so iconic. Get all of that off the air. Mm -hmm. That shouldn't be on the air anymore. Instead, these very offended people that hated Roseanne's actions said, well, "I mean, we could just change the title." And, yeah, and we then can still, we can still make money. On you know, this. yeah, we could just call it the Connors, and we'll still make a few bucks. You right? know what's also bullshit is like they they disguised that sentiment as, "Well, we can't just fire all these like these people that are right. be working on the show." It's like, all right. But in another circumstance, you would drop these people. If, if you know what I mean, if, like for of some course. reason it wasn't going to make you the money you wanted it to make you. Well, right. If the show sucked, yeah. would you be like, "Well, well, it's putting these people out of jobs." If if, if the <laughs> producers, know? if the producers n knew that Roseanne being kicked off was going to kill the show, it would have been done. Right. They wouldn't have stuck with it for a second, but they knew that they had good public sentiment, so they stuck with it, and they're going. They know they were going to make e probably even more money. Yeah, and then they did this thing, which I have zero problem with them doing. But it's interesting if you're so you know sympathetic to people and and conscious of the problems that you know the average American goes through. It's very interesting that the way they do they kill her off and make some jokes about like drug addiction and like, Ambien and shit like that. And it's like, oh, really? So like you understand that, that stuff like that is funny. That's interesting. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? Like, you're not so – you you don't say, like, oh, well, a drug addict could be offended by that or Roseanne is really going through something. Maybe we should be – you don't give a fuck about that. No. So don't act, you know, so pure, which, again, I have no problem with. But it's interesting when the people that try to act pure show their complete hypocrisy. It's a one-way street, yeah, of course, for sure. Yeah. 
But uh, so be it. You know, I think Roseanne has done stand up a little bit, and I've seen her do some things online, but her career effectively is dead, at least in any sort of mainstream circles, or the Roseanne that we knew is gone pretty much. Yeah. Um, but what do we have left for clips? Uh, we have the Norm McDonald Live. Yeah. So this is. Um, show. Uh, a good way to uh, remember Roseanne. I feel this is the two best clips from her appearance on Norm McDonald Live. I say remember like she's dead. She's still with us. Um, but this is basically Norm dumping on Adam Egan more than anything. But I just wanted to throw yeah, it that's, in here. Yes. Remember when you had the, the jokes about you old Gibbons? You know, that was, oh, that yeah. Was, <laughs> <laughs> you know, big one guy. Hey, <laughs> and I didn't even know who he was when I was a kid, but I just laughed. I still don't know. Who's you old Gibbons? He... I, he was fam- I think he did Grape Nut Cereals commercial. I love now I have to explain to this fucking guy. <laughs> <laughs> it was like about like um, roughage. Yeah. And, you know, organic roughage. Got it. Guy. So he wouldn't, he, I didn't even know Grape Nuts had a, you know, that's right. I didn't know they had a commercial. <laughs> Shut up. Gosh, no. <laughs> For one <laughs> fucking <laughs> minute, you know, trying to talk to a legend of comedy. <laughs> talk about, all right. I'm sorry. Brian Regan <laughs> plays Salt Lake City, and he does it for a month straight. He wow. does? That makes sense. They love him. He's one of the few guy. that's just that good and, he's just and so works clean. so clean. Yeah, yeah so clean. perfectly clean. And he's hilarious. Yeah. That's tough to be that good and, and clean. clean. Yeah, it's impossible. That's so impressive. I'm impressed with clean comics. Me too. Way more impressed than anyone that's that's superior as a, a dirty. It's, it seems like a crush a lot of times. I like dirty ones too. I like them. surreal meeting of the mind. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's one, by the way, where Norm's delivery is the the entire joke. Like if you just said, "Ah, oh, this is a real meeting of the mind," it wouldn't be as funny. The just Norm's delivery fucking kills you. <laughs> so good. Okay. And there's all, there's all like. I, I the thing I love about Norm. This is you're just gonna be end with me talking about Norm for twenty minutes. Um, when he's talking about Regan there, where like the way he says it, you don't even know if he's lying. He goes, Brian Regan performs in Salt Lake City and does it for a month straight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah. is he joking? Is he, what is he doing? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, speaking of Norm, by the way, Norm wrote on Roseanne mm-hmm. and was really grateful to her for a lot of years for kind of giving him one of his very early opportunities. Um, so shout out to Roseanne for that. Maybe we wouldn't have Norm McDonald if it wasn't for Roseanne. That's something. Who knows? Um, but. Yeah, overall, Roseanne's certainly not one of my favorite comics, but I do think kind of underappreciated strictly for what she did, not who she is as a person or anything. But if you want true diversity and you want different perspectives and different upbringings to be represented in Hollywood and things like that, then Roseanne is who you're going to (laughs) get. Like, I'm sorry. If you really want the voices of America to be represented, then you're going to get some, you know, Ray Romanos and Jerry Seinfelds that are super clean cut, don't have a lot of controversies with their name or anything like that. You're also going to get Roseanne's, you know, and you're going to get Tracy Morgan and you're going to get Cat Williams and you're going to get some crazy fucking people that are that are in Hollywood if you want true diversity. So the reality is, is that Hollywood has never wanted that. And uh, at some point, they're going to have to be honest about it because it's hitting like a tipping point where it's like, well, if you don't really want these things, why do you keep propping these people up? But uh, shout out to Roseanne. Uh, I said I, sh- I think we should start doing this more where we tease the uh, next episodes if we Ooh. have. So the next couple that we're recording are uh, Chevy Chase, who, by the way, if you're speaking of uh, difficult to work with, Roseanne looks like a real treat from what it sounds like yeah. compared to Chevy Chase. And then uh, one a lot of people have requested is the original Kings of Comedy. So that's coming up in a couple weeks as well. Um, like I said, we record this at the Vaulted Podcast Studios in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. You can hit up uh, Matt from RI on Twitter. Yep, just DM me. Just come straight to, to right. me. Matt just go to go str- Matt from RI on Twitter. Hit him up. And uh, he'll get you all hooked up here. They don't just do recordings, by the way. They film stuff. Yeah. So uh, anything you need in that world, hit up Vaulted Podcast in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. And uh, you can find this program. BlindMike.net is uh, where you can find all the links to to the show to support the show for free. Or if you like it so much that you're willing to support the show financially, which we do appreciate, then um, you can go to the Patreon and find our merchandise. And all that is BlindMike.net. And uh, we will talk to you guys later. On why are you laughing?